Thanks so much for being here. It's been really fun to have you at MPAC in the last couple of weeks with um, exploring our spaces and helping me to also discover our spaces oh, right. and, and the sound. Um, I realized actually um, about, maybe not for stuff, but I realized when you had your surgery was it the same week that I had my interview, my final interview for here. And so I really remember what timing the what was because you were it was in the just of lots of things and I was thinking about you a lot. And so I, there's, since, since I even was at the final stage of interviewing for my job um, and you were one of the people that I said, I really want to bring this woman to MPAC. She's doing fantastic work and just sending good thoughts to you. I so really I'm so, so excited that you're here. <laughs> Um, you manifested it. <laughs> <laughs> so I want maybe let's we'll start with the the um, we're honored that you're here and uh, what have you been doing here the last couple weeks in the two different spaces because we've been doing some more strictly kind of recording things in this space in the concert hall but we've also been working in the theater so could you walk through kind of what we've been doing? Yeah, I guess we can taking chance again um, before even driving up here. I had one last moment the day before where I called you and um, I created a sound installation and light installation at the kitchen in 2015 where I purchased I thought 50 feet of uh, white scrim but it turns out to be 95 feet of white psych <laughs> so I didn't even know what I had but it was this huge ball of fabric in my studio and I just I've been wanting to work with it but it's just so much fabric I just haven't had any room anywhere to even look at it let alone get an idea of how 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 big it was and um, so I really appreciate that you said that I was able to bring it here to unfurl it here because it would be the first time since that installation the deinstall of that installation that I've been able to see it all out in a space so that was really exciting to be able to use the uh, theater as a a large studio space to be able to gain a, a, a perspective of size of materials that I already own. And then when we unfurled it and hung it up just so I could see its condition, we discovered these beautiful crease patterns. And this ball of fabric has been pressed for five years and, you know, it's been pushed around and moved around, but it still maintained this shape. and. I had a, um, a sculpture show at the Rauschenberg Estate in uh, 2016. It was called Tightly Wound. And uh, in the art studio of the estate, they have just a bunch of rolls of paper that have been rolled for 10 years, 15 years, that nobody uses. And at the time, I was uh, getting prepared for a watercolor solo exhibition at the Harnett Museum of Art. And I wanted to use some paper to see if I could paint these particular watercolors larger than what I had been painting them. And so I was taking these, these large rolls of paper were six feet tall, taller than me, and I was carrying them. And one night I was trying to place them against a wall so that I could paint on it from a projector, um, projecting onto the paper. But this one roll of paper was like six feet long and it was giving me such a struggle. And it just kept rolling and hitting my face when I tried to push it out, you know, and unfurl it. And I was like, ah, these rolls of paper have been rolled for five, 10 years. Like, they won't unfurl, they're so, they're so tightly wound. And then I just was like, well, I'm gonna just put in some nails in this one side and then I'll push it and then I'll nail the other side so it'll be flat. Um, still thinking that I was going to intentionally paint on it. And then when I placed uh, the nails on the one side, the roll just stood up against the wall as if it was this Baldessari like ceram ceramic kind of piece or something and and I just was stunned just staring at it and I was just like oh my god that's a sculpture right there that's a piece and so then I started to look at the other rolls completely forgot all about the painting show and just started putting up the rolls on because in Rauschenberg's studio um, this was in his private estate so you work in his studio that he worked in and he has these huge walls and I never have access to space you know so then I was just putting these rolls of paper everywhere to see how they would unfurl if you just put one side up how does it fall with time like so this this one roll was rolled for 10 years so it won't it won't move at all this one was rolled yesterday so it's really loose you know like and I decided that 
would be um, a, my, a, a sculpture solo show of just all of these rolls of paper that have been affixed to a wall and choose their shape based on how they fall and based on time and their own experience that you'll never really know. But that tightening, that pressing, that action is, is an act and uh, it, it, it is a gesture if you, if you want to see it that way. And so when we pulled out the psych and it had these beautiful crease patterns, it looks like topography. It looks like when you look at a, at a microscope, a vinyl record under a microscope, which was my painting show was about, um, I, I was just stunned. And then I felt really guilty. I was like, am I over romanticizing like wrinkled fabric? And uh, Ryan was really funny, and I appreciate it. He's like, yes, you are, but that's your job. And I really appreciate that from Ryan, because um, <laughs> he's right. Like, that, that is my job, is to look at these little moments and, and find the beauty in them and figure out a way to highlight them so that other people can see that the beauty in, in the mistake and the damage and the, in the unintentional crease that, you know, someone else that would see the psych would want to just steam it out and get the creases out. But I've just decided... I want to see the creases. I want to see how we can en enhance the creases and make this into a sculpture. This is a piece, almost like a like, Japanese landscape painting from like the 17th century. You know, just you, there's a story to it. It's it's th there's a topography there, a narrative, um, and so to use to have access to a theater space that, that the size of what's here at MPAC uh, was so beneficial in that way. It I I have a new love relationship with this fabric now that I know what it what what it's capable what what it actually has and now we're gonna ball it up again and it's gonna have some new creases but they won't be as strong as the other guys because that was five years and this will only be a few months because I'll be coming back to look at it again and so I'm hoping with time while I'm here with the psych I can start to devise some kind of a a configuration of it where it becomes a sculptural aspect of a, either a performance piece. It could be a performative sound sculpture, or it's just a backdrop or a projection screen, or you know, there's so many different ways that this huge piece of material can um, evolve. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing where the creases take me next. I mean, even with your, with your performance, you often talk about sculpture a lot more than music, as you mentioned. And, with some of these records that, as you said, you've been collecting for 18 years yeah. and performing with, um, over time, the scratches and rubbing together um, create a different kind of topography on the record that then as you kind of, you were in this previous improv, you were banging the chair on the floor and mm. bumping the record player so that the, it's as though the needle is following the topography of this record. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, since you, you talk so much about all these various aspects of your practice that people would normally separate into sound music and art, right. uh, that um, a lot of your inspiration for both comes from these really strong art movements. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of those art movements that you've been mentioning this week as oh, right. worked. Yeah, uh, well definitely the Flexus art movement of the 60s was such a huge influence in my practice. Um, also, of course, my mentor uh, Pauline Oliveros and her deep listening meditations and just her approach to improvisation as a whole. Um, and her as an artist too. She, she really was a conceptual sound artist. She just was at a time where sound art was so young um, and the boys were just dominating, which is really a shame because if you look at her, her uh, instructions, per performance pieces of instructions, it's music for everyone. You know, you, you can perform it too. And, um, and then for her to have this certificate program where you can learn her practice, get the certificate, and then you can teach it too. And she's been gone now since 2016, but everyone is still teaching it. Everyone is still showing her work. and. And that was after she passed away. Um, it really was touching for me to be like, "Wow, that was that was her piece. That was what she her that was her life work. That was what that was all for. Because now it's being dispersed, and she's still alive, but it's in a completely different way. And that is so smart. I love how um, artists of uh, before me. I love this approach of taking a step back and looking at it as a whole." Um, 
looking at her small compositions that include everybody as this gesture where not only can everyone perform this, but they can walk away knowing that they did, and then they can share it with others, and then it just feeds from there. Um, and uh, also the work of Robert Irwin, um, another artist that I hold very dearly. Um, his book, uh, I, n I can never say the title <laughs> correctly, but um, it's Seeing the Thing, oh, I always mess it up. Um, anyway, it, he has this really great book that he was interviewed over 20 years, and um, it's this guy that was following him around for a couple decades, and uh, the, the main point about the book that I find so inspiring is he was able to take something so simple, which was a flat surface and paint, and then he looked at the paint and he said, well, I like white. So then he went towards the white, but it still wasn't white enough. So then he put light on it, a light bulb and a fixture. And then it moved to light fixtures and no more paint. And it was still white, but it was still not the right light that he was looking for. And then now he's in his 80s and all of his work just deals with the curvature of the earth and the direction of the sun and how angles are placed with white scrim. And to go from a paint of white to the curve of the earth and the sun, to me, is that that's an arc of artistic creativity that I can only wish I, I can achieve someday. And I feel like I'm trying to get there. I, f I don't see a direct relationship with, with music. Um, I see myself more as a conceptual sound artist. And the turntablism was definitely the starting point. But even before the turntablism, I was a DJ as a teenager. So it's just been an ongoing creative process um, that has now gotten me to a point where my solo exhibitions are painting shows or sculpture shows. They don't really have speakers in them. Um, I don't really find sound installation as the only presentation format for sound art. I find it's very, very um, dangerous, uh, especially right now in a very important time in sound art for the art industry to try to push it in that way. I'm, I'm don't, not saying that other artists that deal with speakers shouldn't. I'm just saying that the art industry shouldn't only capitalize on sound art as if it's performance practice, like music industry, with only I I sonic emission. Um, sound art is conceptual. Sound art is vibration. Um, it's, it's all of the elements that even when you imagine a sound, when you dream, are you, are you listening? Are you hearing? Where, what is that sound? You know, th there's so much more to sound than, uh, than uh, music industry does with stage and performance and speakers. And so I feel like I'm, I'm using Robert Irwin's arc of how he stepped away from a material and he saw it, he found it, but it, in, a, in a much larger um, perspective. That, that's sort of how I hope uh, the rest of my career can evolve into. And I think, I think it's getting there because I'm dealing with different materials and I'm trying to see, see it, how it all can either interact or not. And, and I'm willing to accept if, if the psych isn't a good, you know, if it's just a bunch of fabric, I'm willing to, to take that hit if, that, <laughs> if that's the case. Oh, well, we were talking too about how kind of different conceptions of sound art and in an exhibit or an installation if you, uh, that sometimes it doesn't seem necessarily like the artists are thinking about uh, what time they want the audience to be spending with the work. You know, and I think that in both your performance practice of these things and thinking about slowing things down or speeding things up and, and going backwards, and what yeah. does it mean to sample something and make the past present or to hold on to a moment in a certain way mm -hmm. or to deal with the temporality of this thing that was squished and putting it back together and kind of um, how can we in an installation format, I, I don't think that then that means that you don't have to think about how much time does the audience or the viewer engage with the work. I mm. think then even more we have to think about what does that work then say about this work in time or how time works with the work. Um. Yeah, it's still time-based, um, but it's not emitted. And that to me is really interesting. I feel like nobody is really hooking onto that. Um, even even the psych is a time-based work. Right. 
it was five years being crushed before I, I pulled it all out again and discovered it. Mm -hmm. um, and that to me makes it a durational piece. It's just that we met it at the end of it. Right. You know, this could have just been a big ball sitting in a gallery for five years and then we pulled it out there and then that would have been the durational performance of it. But I don't know very many galleries that would let me do that. Because so. <laughs> it, it's always just a little too far out, you know, um, which is why I think my career, I skipped into museums real quick because I feel like because of art industry and the gallery structure, the way that I present my work just doesn't coincide and that's fine. I don't need to participate in that economic structure because I function with academia and with my fan base of touring. And even though right now I'm in the middle of this medical sabbatical, um, I can now find a reason to release objects that are based in music industry, like CDs and LPs and things, but now it has a artistic meaning to it because I can't be in front of you performing until uh, the fall of 2021. Um, I, I, these albums are almost like little postcards from my medical sabbatical where I'm like, I'm okay. Even this video now is a little postcard to all of my fans that have been so kind and uh, so supportive. Um, I just feel like, being able to participate in those um, objects right now uh, makes sense because of the situation that I'm in, which is very, very unique, very chance-based. Even the disorder I had is like only 2% of the world population. <laughs> so it's like, you know, super rare surgery, like really, you know, unknown. There was no way of knowing if I was even gonna be able to hear when I, was, when I would wake up on the left side of my, of my uh, face. So um, everything since, since that time frame has all been chance, like just being really slow, letting your body heal, and then having the fans reach out, checking in, making sure you're okay, and people sending you little videos of them breaking records or tearing out the pages of pages nine through 12 of my uh, turntablism book, um, still participating with the interactiveness of the book. And so there's still a life to it. And I'm trying to become more uh, aware of how I can still participate with, but not in the way that I, I have before. And I think being here and seeing how this ball of psych has become this thing is, is almost giving me a, a leading line of some sorts where I'm, I wanna think about my life like that. Like it was this big ball that I'm unfurling now. My symptoms have been gone now for a little over six months, which has been amazing. Um, I hope it stays that way until 2021 so that I can be officially cured of my disorder. Um, and that will probably be when I unfurl the ball and see all of the amazing creases in it. Um, and I definitely see impact as the, as the, one of the m many vessels that I'm so grateful to have uh, during this time period to support me. Um, uh, it's, it's, so f it's so amazing to have Chance bring this as an opportunity when you were working towards it without my even knowing it. Mm -hmm. And for us to be able to be sitting here now, I think is, it's, it's really lucky and I'm, I'm very grateful for it. You've talked a little bit about getting into abstract turntablism from being a DJ as a teenager. Yeah. And I was wondering if you would share that story of the first <laughs> time that you really had a moment of inspiration with uh, this type of, this of type. DJing. <laughs> yeah, that's, I tell this story a lot, but um, I'll try to be really quick about it. Um, so it, it all stemmed from I was DJing at the time. I was with a group of techno guy DJs in Houston, and one day I just I started listening to the ends of records, the lands ends I call them, where the um, stamp is, where the sticker is, the locked groove, and um, it's an unintentional rhythm. It's just a result of the machine. It's not really supposed to be there, but it's part of it. And uh, so I thought that that was at the time I was I think 18, 19, and I thought it sounded so cool. And then Autocur and all of these Sub Rosa type minimal electronic people started coming out. And I was listening to this ends and I was like, this is the same thing. It's just not with the fancy uh, software that everyone's making this other stuff from. It's just a glitch. And everyone, all of my DJ friends thought I was, you know, crazy. And then one day I tried to DJ in a club where it was only the ends of the records. And I got kicked out about 15 minutes in. Um, and they said I was never going to DJ in Houston again, and they were right. The last, the next time that I DJed in Houston after that was in 2017. So they 
they meant business. <laughs> but when I when I came back and DJed again, it it, it was a very sweet moment um, to be able to do my first love in in the city that I fell in love with, you know, w with it with. So um, that was also a very brutal time because. I knew there was something to it, but no, nobody was supporting me. And I didn't really understand what it was. And I started listening on uh, Rice University in Houston. They had a KTRU radio 91.7. I ended up being a DJ for them a few years later for their uh, dance music, uh, Friday night, 9, to 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. It was a really great radio station. It's still around, but now it's mainly online, KTRU. Um, and every Sundays, they would have uh, an avant-garde experimental jazz show, like, all day long. And uh, I was listening to it one day, just not understanding what was going on. And they said that uh, the DJ on the radio um, was saying, oh, there's a free jazz show with Joe McPhee and Dominique Duval at Diverse Works Gallery. And I had no idea that you could have a show in an art gallery. Uh, and I had no idea who these people were. And I was like, I'm just going to go and see what, what's what this deal is. And then I watched Joe play with Dominique and you know later on I would know who they were but at the time I didn't I had no place of reference and I watched them play and Joe is like for our last piece I picked up this flower and we're going to describe the flower with our set, with, with, with this next piece. And I was just like you could do that. Like oh and then they did this really beautiful improvisation. And then afterwards, I went up to this uh, person, David Dove, who's an abstract trombonist and the director of Nameless Sound. At the time, it was the Pauline Oliveros Foundation. And he was the, uh, the one hosting the show. And at the time, I was getting an audio engineering associate's technical degree. Uh, and I needed an internship. And so I asked him, can I intern with you? Because I, I don't get this, but I want to I learn more. And he said, the only way you can be an intern is if you take my improvisation classes that I have after school. And I didn't know at the time that all of the, all, pr pretty much a lot of the things we were learning were Pauline's deep listening meditations. And um, a, a lot of the lessons were derived from her books and her teachings, but I didn't realize it at the time. But so I went to one, the, my first session with them as a group of 10 of us. Many of them were all still very close, still performed together. Uh, and Dave said, you and me, we're going to improvise. Oh, I forgot to say, when he invited me to this class, I told him, I'm not a musician, I'm a DJ. I, so I don't, I, maybe I, I should just show up. And he's like, well, no, bring a turntable and let's see what happens. And I was just like, oh, okay. And so I brought a turntable, just one. I'm like, you only bring one? Like, what? Like, do you bring the whole setup? Like, because DJ culture, there's always a pair. There's never just a singular turntable. And um, so that was already blowing my mind. And, and then Dave was like, I want, I want to improvise with you like for a few minutes. And that was when I had this really crazy out-of-body experience that I still remember to this day, where I was just watching myself, watching my hands. I could hear what he was doing, and I, and I was participating. And I didn't know why I was participating, but I knew that it was working. And, and then afterwards, when it, when it ended, I knew that I heard the ending, which I'd never even, that concept never even, you know, came to mind before. And then I came back in and I was like, <gasps> and our friend Lucas Gorham, he goes, we got her. <laughs> and, I, and everyone laughed. I was just like, yeah, you got me. I, I'm in. I'm, I'm convinced. And I quit DJing altogether and just started focusing on this work. and. Then the DJing came back on its own uh, in 2013, and uh, that was in Basel at the House for Electronic Sh uh, Elektronische Künste in uh, Basel, and that was a really exciting moment for the DJing to come back to me, so that I can re, you know, go back into it and have this new relationship with it, where I'm not kicked out of anything anymore. I'm, I have my niche, I have my my career. I can still and I can still do what I I originally loved and. So it's been a really sweet process, the way everything has come back together and, and evolved. And, um, but it was, it was really that moment, improvising with Dave. And I'm forever grateful to Dave. He pretty much introduced me to everything I know now in, in sound and art. You were mentioning yesterday a little bit that you often get asked uh, how your practice is 
related to or different from hip hop because mm. of the same medium. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, just kind of how you unpack that for people in terms of uh, how the medium itself is not necessarily related to genre. Right. And that sampling can be used in a lot of different ways and how you think about sampling, if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, just so that it's on record here. Um, I certainly feel very frustrated with the avant-garde to ignore how revolutionary Grand Wizard Theodore and, uh, and uh, Grandmaster Flash's action was to just put their hand on the surface area of a turntable, let alone pull a beat back and throw it back in in the middle of a party. Like that, you, you, in the 70s, you couldn't, I mean, those machines couldn't really work that way anyway, you know? They weren't, they, the machinery itself has also evolved because of how p humans have interacted with it, which I find beautiful. Um, it's gotten stronger, sturdier, can do even more things. And, uh, and I just feel that once, that I feel that there, the bridge between hip hop and the and sound art needs to happen in order for the musique concrète sound art side that utilizes this machine um, can no longer look down on hip hop culture as if it's not of an equal place. If anything, hip hop is even more important than musique concrète ever was because they commercialized it. They created two new genres of music. They saved the music industry. They, in the early 80s, the music industry was failing. And then suddenly you have hip hop and it's making millions of dollars in the matter of five, you know, five, 10 years. And now it is ingrained in every culture all over the world. You have tribes in the mountains of Colombia rapping in their native tongue. That's only like maybe a hundred people. You know, you don't have any other music, music genre that has affected the world the way that hip-hop has. And it really makes me um, angry that when I'm looking at these books about music concrete and the avant-garde in the 20th century, that hip-hop is completely ignored. And I hope one day to start a petition to try to get Grand Wizard Theater and Grandmaster Flash a MacArthur grant, a MacArthur fellowship, because they, just, they are geniuses. They, they, this one hand gesture changed the course of the rest of the music industry for until what we have now. I mean, remix culture is the epitome of pop right now. Like it's all about remixing a song mm -hmm. that was a popular song 10 years ago. Like it's almost like it's eating itself, remix culture. And it wouldn't have happened had uh, hip hop not made the kind of impact that it had. So I hope, um, I hope with time, there will be more of a conversation about how these legitimate music concrete artists that happen to live in a lower income uh, demographic deserve to be included in the in the conversation of, of sound art and the history of it yeah I think we see now some of the you know the the Pulitzer and some of these other prizes kind of individually started, trying yeah. to make a difference or um, herb Albert and in some of the people that they've picked in the last couple of years to value different backgrounds of music yeah. and uh, certainly kind of from more of the the textbooks that we were m more related to with um, kind of experimental and electronic music I'm happy to see that now s some of those are included um, you know are including hip-hop artists yeah. in, a, in a way that's uh, that makes sense for for what we're teaching and and especially in New York where I used to be teaching and mm -hmm. and kind of that the students don't see why those things wouldn't all be there anyway, right? To them, it's of course we should be studying both these things at the same time. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's, I think it's something that's kind of what you were saying about connecting those. I don't know that they're always connected in the same way in terms of the musique concrète side. And maybe you could explain what musique concrète is if for someone watching this who is not necessarily a part of that tradition. Sure, it's a, a form of early sampling, but with, without the intention of a musical form, a musical shape. It was, a, it was an early attempt at playback collage, playback technology as collage, rather than playing back the technology for what it was made for. Um, and that's exactly what these guys were doing too. Mm -hmm. I will say, um, 
outside of the fact that this genre, hip hop and myself, we're both using the same machinery, it doesn't mean that we're doing, we have the same intentions. Um, hip hop has the intention of musicality, of song form, of some type of form, whereas my work is dealing with form, but it's a more sculptural form. It's subtraction of, of the material itself with the needle and um, a sculpture session in progress. Uh, so that, that there's definitely a divide in, in, in that performative sense. And I think that was really well um, expressed by Anthony Braxton, who said, uh, it, I'm not saying the quote exactly perfectly, but it, it really stuck with me. Um, it's like, just because I'm black and on a saxophone doesn't mean I'm, I'm playing jazz. And I, I see the turntable in the same sense. Like just because I'm performing with a turntable doesn't mean I'm making hip hop. But I'm not saying that hip hop is not in relationship to this whole uh, family. Um, and I hope someday we can uh, really begin to uh, graciously rebuild the divide where we can give them the kind of uh, respect that they deserve. I think especially with the, some of the the sounds that you're using in this, and we talked a little bit before, but um, I was wondering if you could also, in that vein, talk a little bit about how you choose the records and whether or not they're damaged um, when you get them, and um, for the ones that you've had for a really long time, how did you damage them? Was it intentional, or It's all you... chance, <laughs> it's all chance. Um, I love to have them, well, there, there's a process. When they're brand new, they stay sealed until it's time to play them in front of people. For now, with the medical sabbatical, I'm not really sure how that's going to evolve, but maybe impact can be part of that process. So if I continue to receive records, I might have to just play them here, save them for here. <laughs> um, and then once I play them and I get a sense of what they sound like, they start to live outside of their sleeve and with my regular vocabulary where they're all sleeveless and they're always being shifted around and moved around and then they live in a little luggage box that I was touring all over the world with and then they were shaking around, dance, dancing with each other and um, every now and then I would break one, you know, and then there would be shards nicking the other surface areas of the other records and, um, and ultimately what, like with the, the oldest records that I have in my vocabulary, they're just covered in the language of time and I really see every scratch, every nick as this, untran like this untranslatable language that we'll, we will never understand because we only know language in a vocal sense. We don't understand physical language, a physical gesture. This, this happened here because of time. I think our bodies are really good examples of it. Like I have a really big scar on my knee here that's been there since I was eight. And that's like me walking through life and whatever is leaving its mark on me is the language of time. And, I see these records in the same in the same way, where they're just living, and somehow they end up with me, and um, it gives them a new life. It gives them a way to reframe their content in a more contemporary way, um, although they're not aware that that's what's happening. But the presence of them for me, the meaning of it, and then just to have them all be together over time, and keeping the good records in their sleeves to have a surface area that's clean in order for it, because that's also a vocabulary sound um, additive into the work, um, a clean sound in conjunction with one that's just completely annihilated from time. Um, and then also all of those gestures, all of those marks on the surface area of a record that has been brutally, you know, living through time, um, it then acts as an implement to the needle where the needle can no longer stay on the spiral of the, of the actual spiral itself, so it has no choice but to dance around because it, it can't hold on to anything anymore. And so then it completely dissects the original recording and the original, original recording no longer is being heard the way it was meant to be heard. It's, it has a new presence and that's because time interfered and I don't ever get to have the choice of when when time will completely destroy something to the point where I can't even hear my favorite part anymore, you know? There was even a, a record I was telling my assistant Clara the other day, it's a Charlemagne Palestine record that I love to ruin, and I've been ruining for over 10 years, and the edges of the record are now starting to flake off, like pop off a little. And I was getting a little nervous. I was like, I don't want it to break. And she's like, but that's your work. <laughs> I was like, damn it. 
So it, it was, um, that's going to be a brutal moment when Charlemagne starts to de totally deteriorate, but it, I have to accept it and allow it to be what it's meant to become with time. And there's this one particular piece I love to perform on, on it, but even that piece, I've been performing it for so many years, it's not even hitting the same points that, I, that it was before, but it still is a form that's so beautiful in the sculpture. It always becomes a really gorgeous sculpture in some way. And, um, but there will be a moment, either it'll break or there'll be just so much time that it'll just be static. And I, I think that's beautiful too. I love that you said that the needle ha can, uh, um, can't help but dance yeah. on the records. And, and you can really see, like see that with some of, the, <laughs> some of the shots now, especially when it's skipping around the different layers of, of records. And it was making me think about this. Um, there's a Saul Williams text a uh, poem that's the question that wings ask and the whole trajectory of the poem is kind of like the, the only thing we can do is dance to live to, to keep living right with all of this that, that what, what we have to do is keep dancing and I, I love that that's <laughs> kind of the way that you describe this it's a beautiful needle. parallel my gosh so poetic uh -huh. and the, the other thing it was making me think about too was just kind of the the physicality of it, even all of the ways that you talk about it are so physical, and I think the way you discover the records and the way that you conceptualize them, and I wonder if that relates at all to um, kind of your very first formative years when physical and tactile was a, a much more important to you, because you've said you couldn't right, hear couldn't when hear. you were born. Yeah, I don't have any memory from before I heard my first sound, so I have nothing to compare my the way I interacted with things too. I only know how I deal with it now. And I don't know if I want to be so romantic about not being able to hear for the first two, three years of my life. But I do think I have a different relationship with emission, sonic emission, mm -hmm. than um, others do. And especially now with my skull in the condition that it is. And my hearing actually got better. Uh, after the surgery and so that's something that I've been trying to preserve all year because I don't know any sound artists that get older and their hearing gets better <laughs> it's me so I really see it as a, a gem that I want to I want to cultivate and and really care for and uh, the with the skull it's so bizarre it's like certain frequencies that you wouldn't think would bother you not only bother you, but get inside your skull. Like it's really, it's it's not even a pain anymore because I'm I'm 11 months after the surgery. It still gets a little sore, but it's really more of an irritating, like annoying uh, feeling. And to learn more about sound in that way is has been really eye-opening as well. Um, the vibration of it, and when and you're not expecting that sound to be the one you think it's going to be the other sound, the more low end, the hurt, you know, because that one hurt before. And it's like, oh, I didn't expect this one too. And, and also for it to be 11 months and it's still, I still, like, I can't be in a busy restaurant still. It, it, I can feel it in my head. And so it's, it's really interesting to relearn how to listen and to understand how I'm hearing because um, they're two separate things. And, uh, and preserving the hearing side of it and, and advising that for the listening side um, as it continues to cultivate itself. And, um, but I think because I've been dealing with sound in this, in this way for such a long time, um, I'm just more aware of it too. I'm not saying that everyone is going to be, if they have this surgery, everyone's going to have the same sensations or uh, realizations. Um, but I think it's, it is funny that my ears have pretty much been like part of major parts of my life. Like whether it be that I could hear again and finally speak or that I can now, um, my face is no longer deformed because my symptoms are gone because I had this surgery. Um, and, but now be, through the healing, I have to relearn to hear again. And um, it's, it, it, that's something that that's, I found really funny about the whole arc of my life so far is like, what's up with my ears? It's like, it's like the, it's like the theme of my life, and it's unintentional. I, I never meant for it to be like that. And, but I'm grateful that I can hear more now. And um, I'm curious to see when I'm able to get back into touring and being in these large venues again, how it's, how it's going to affect 
how I play now. Um, I feel like I'm a lot more gentle, um, and but I also feel like when I was performing prior to the surgery with my disorder, I was in a completely different headspace. I was totally out of it, touring too much. You know, my face was, I, I was trying to ignore. I knew that it was deforming in front of people and I still had to keep a certain attitude and, you know, try to, you know, ignore it. And it, it was, it all puts your head in a, in a mind space that's not clear, not to mention other things that I discovered later that helped cloud my, my, uh, my reality. And so now to be able to perform here and to have a clear head, um, no symptoms and to, to perform with knowing that my face isn't going to deform in the middle of it and that there's nothing to worry about. It's, I feel like everything has a, more of a gentle flow to it than it did prior. And I, I, hope, I hope that shows up even more when it's time to be back with everybody. Well, I think just it's, it's so incredible to have a, a career where part of what we do is, is constantly kind of look back into ourselves and keep practicing listening, which, as you said, is a big part of um, Pauline Oliveros, who worked here at, right. at RPI at the end of her life. Um, but that, that I, I also think that that's, that's really beautiful and kind of some of the new things that you've been exploring recently with the two turntables mm. again and this new element of transition in a different way and kind of feeling out the spatialization around you and um, I just I think that's a really beautiful thing to also be exploring now of kind of slowing things down and that element of transition that's different from when you were just performing on one turntable. Yeah, for sure. Um, which kind of go comes back to just when we're dealing with different kind of restrictions around time or different restrictions about what our bodies can do as we age. Um, how does that affect our practice? And um, we are, you know, we're not Olympic gymnasts, <laughs> we no. can actually continue to have a career that is r enriched by the fact that our bodies have to deal, deal with different things. Yeah, and, it forces um, us into different life situations that, I mean, that, that's, the, that's the ebb and flow of, of chance. Mm -hmm. It's really just, oh, you have a rare brain disorder with a really difficult, one of the wor most difficult brain surgeries in the world. How are you going to get through this? And then finding, just on my own, because I had no, no doctor helping me. I, I've figured this all out with my mother. Um, and then suddenly, this neurosurgeon in Japan, and he's the best one in the world. And then sudden, you know, then I'm there, and then now I'm here. And um, it's it, even though it's unfortunate, it's still an opportunity. And I, 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 I'm, I refuse to see it otherwise. 